Great. Thank you so much. Welcome, everybody. Um, we're excited to have you today. We're here with Cannabis Lab for another monthly event. Um, we're having a great thought panel today. We're discussing the future of industrial hemp. My name is Amanda Barton. I am one of the co-presidents of Cannabis Lab. I'm an attorney uh, specializing in business law, and we help all sorts of companies, both cannabis and hemp industry clients. Uh, so please reach out if you have any questions. Um, some quick announcements before we get going. Our sponsor for this evening is Blaze Staffing. Um, if you have any staffing needs, please reach out to them. They'd be more than happy to help. So thank you, Blaze. We appreciate your sponsorship. Um, we have for our Cannabis Lab members, uh, Cureleaf is offering a discount code right now for our members. Buy one, get one 50% off on their products. It does not include their flower products, but uh, use the code CLAB just the letter C in lab, L-A-B, um, and you will get that discount. Um, additionally, we have some great events coming up in November for you. On November 12th, we have another panel that's going to be discussing the new edible rules and edibles here in the state of Florida. And on November 19th, we're gonna be discussing careers in cannabis, both in the cannabis industry and hemp industries. Uh, so stay tuned for those, those are coming in the future. I wanna give a huge shout out to Ricardo Alvarez uh, for helping put together today's panel. If you do not know Ricardo, you should. He is the regional director for the Florida Department of Agriculture and Con Consumer Services here in the state of Florida. Uh, he oversee, uh, the FDAX oversees the Florida Hemp Program um, and he's been, he serves on our leadership and has been very involved in, in the hemp industry. Uh, he has been huge again in putting this panel on today. So Ricardo, thank you very much. We appreciate your efforts. Um, and with that, I would like to introduce our panel. Again, we're talking about the future of industrial hemp. We have today uh, Jeff Green, who will be our moderator. Uh, has, he is the Vice President of Marketing for the Florida Hemp Council. He runs Florida Hemp Council. Um, he's been researching hemp in the cannabinoid system for several years. Um, he's worked with Green Roads beginning in, in 2016. As a lobbyist, he was very, very involved when it came to passing several hemp bills through the Florida legislature, and he is definitely a wealth of knowledge for us. Um, so we thank you very much uh, for your efforts here today, Jeff, and uh, I'll let you take it from there to introduce the rest of our panelists. Great. Thanks, Amanda. I appreciate it. My earbuds died right when we get started, so technical difficulties. Uh, so thanks everybody for joining us. Um, I wanted to uh, let the panelists introduce themselves. So I'm going to share uh, each of your names and if you will unmute uh, from there and kind of tell uh, the, the public about yourselves. And we'll just go from uh, left to right. So David Klein, uh, a Kentucky sharecropper, as he puts it, I'll let you start. Uh, that's a pleasure. Thanks, Jeff. It's nice to be here today. Um, I am a Kentucky sharecropper. Um, I've been working with hemp um, since you were allowed to work with hemp. Uh, very interested in it both medicinally and most importantly industrially because of its applications. Uh, so I work um, uh, both on the CBD side of industrial hemp, of hemp, but also and most importantly on the industrial side. The industrial side that I work with ranges anywhere from uh, hempcrete and hemp insulation, which we have people who have much more expertise than I am. Um, and we work all the way through pottery and all of the traditional, really indigenous arts and sciences that people have used for years. So from medicine to clothing, uh, to housing. And uh, we have grow all around the world. Uh, our largest grow is just over about 600 acres this last year in Kentucky. And we are sharecroppers. Uh, we take it from uh, very special strains, especially industrial. Uh, we bring it all the way to finished product uh, by using a distribution network globally of people who are already building or creating textiles, et cetera. So that's a, those are my fundamentals. And Jeff, you're muted. Oops, my apologies. Uh, the moderator muted me. Um, so the next person that we'll talk about is uh, with is David Hassenauer. Uh, David with Greenpoint, one of the pilot project uh, organizations in Florida. David, tell us what you're doing. Hey, Jeff. Thank you, and uh, thank you for having me on the panel. Uh, yeah, my name is David Hassenauer. I'm the CEO of Greenpoint Research. Uh, 
and uh, we are biomass originators and processors, um, primarily focused in Florida, uh, although we are operational down in uh, Latin America, out in Colombia, and we uh, primarily focused on, on cannabinoid production, uh, although we have begun uh, branching off into material science and, and fiber and grain as we've uh, started to mature as a company. So again, uh, happy to be here and share some of uh, my experiences. Thanks, David. It looks like we may have lost one of our other panelists. So, Amanda, if they come back on, we will introduce them. In the meantime, um, we'll kind of jump into some of the questions that involve uh, industrial hemp. Um, and part of my research, I guess we'll have to go with Klein and Hassenauer, but easier than David or David. Uh, so, um, Klein, you talked about working with insulation and uh, hempcrete. Um, what, what have been your situations where certifications or um, safety approvals. One of my big things that I understand from working through alternative energy was through lead certification and through uh, building approvals, uh, the, the traditional materials have kind of a lock on what can be used with builders. Um, and they do that through what they call safety, uh, making sure that what is being used is safe for the consumer. So is there safety protocols being done with hemp insulation and hempcrete uh, and hemp fiberboard and that kind of things? Or is it just a, a, a spec builder that's been able to go out and source the stuff and put it in a home that's not really meeting code? No, I, um, it's very interesting what's happening and you gotta kind of take a global perspective on this. So in the United States in certain areas, in particular the Midwest, there are already um, uh, really everybody uh, affiliated with the construction industry from architects to builders, uh, they're already starting to and have designs and models on uh, hempcrete and hemp insulation homes. Uh, there are several small neighborhoods actually, the largest one I know of has 12 homes. Uh, they are completely uh, made of hempcrete and hemp insulation. Hempcrete as you know dries and is so solid you don't need to use rebar in a single family home. Um, and they have codes uh, in Michigan and they have codes in a few states and you have to follow those codes and those specifications and they're stringent. In, in Europe, they've got, and I'll just be brief, in, in, in Europe, they've been doing this since the 1940s. Uh, they started out with other crops and they ended up with hemp. Uh, they actually have companies who have panels pre-made you buy the panels and you can make what we call little homes these days, tiny homes, uh, but very good for traveling into um, more difficult places to get and, and countries that are less, uh, less successful than us in many ways. Right. And then I guess to the beginning of it, uh, Hassenauer, uh, you guys are, are growing specific genetics that are specific for fiber. Can you kind of speak to that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, so I think there's kind of a, a bifurcation there too in that it's specific for fiber because I do think a, a large majority of the hemp fiber crop does come from grain uh, dunnage. It's a, it's a dual harvest where they, they top it and then they go back through and trim the remainder after it's kind of dried out in the field. Um, and, uh, but yeah, we've done, uh, some trials, uh, around the state. We have a couple different pilot sites around Florida, you know, looking, you know, he, going away from what Mr. Klein said at the, the global level and looking at it more at a, uh, you know, micro state focus level, uh, which is really where Greenpoint operates. We've done, uh, several land race, uh, varietal trials, uh, both a, a traditional summer planting as well as a late summer emergence, uh, test to see if we could get a, a basically a late summer seed grain crop out. Uh, and we had some very good success rates. Most of them were from uh, subtropical uh, land races, uh, specifically Chinese land races. Uh, I think one strain that actually performed the best did both on on, on height and, and biomass, as well as the you know the oil content and the omega content uh, of the seed oil. So we have some very promising uh, early returns. But then again, it's still it's so early stage, and Florida's presents some unique challenges uh, where. We don't field red our hemp in Florida like you, you, you could do in uh, Colorado, Wyoming, some of these other places that are, are, we're starting to see uh, the, the grain uh, and fiber industry really emerge. Uh, we have some some other logistical things to start to figure out here, but we do have some very promising uh, seed stock to work with and, and develop. 
Awesome. Thanks, David. And it looks like, Mark, um, are you able to kind of give us a, a bio of who you are and what you do? You're muted. I like this thing. Hi, guys. This is Mark Janczewski, and I am uh, unfortunately driving right now. Coming to you from the uh, Fort Lauderdale International Boat Show. <laughs> All right, you're actually building a few homes over here in Harbor, Fort Lauderdale's Harbor Beach. Uh, so I've been a builder for 30 years, uh, a GC in uh, California for 20 years and 10 now for uh, in Miami and then uh, uh, in Fort Lauderdale, <coughs> based out of uh, Boynton Beach. Uh, mostly been building uh, high-end custom homes from... Uh, and a few million to uh, just did one 25,000 foot home at um, Miami Beach's Star Island, uh, 50 plus million dollar home, finished a year ago. So I'm my background, unfortunately, isn't I can't help you guys too much in terms of this particular and specific product type, but uh, if, from what I gather, I've been asked to chime in on on. Um, what I can offer in terms of custom home building. And I, I used to work for Marcus Millichap and I've done quite a bit of uh, commercial income property, including uh, student housing, uh, self storage, uh, office, mixed use uh, condos, that type of building as well. So where um, you know, I'm interested to uh, offer what I know and then uh, help advance the, uh, the group's agenda here. Uh, my background was uh, UCLA economics, uh, and then construction uh, entirely since then. So, uh, and I do have some contacts as uh, Jeff and David uh, and I had discussed before that um, uh, there's a fellow Sam and I have not yet connected, but I will, um, I will before the end of tomorrow. Uh, he has a great deal of uh, experience in this product type. So I wanted to offer that too. So uh, sorry, I'm not more qualified than you great gentlemen, but uh, here to help and offer what I can. It's good to have a builder on the call, and, and certainly I think as we get through this, um, your nuance of understanding code and understanding building products will, will be something that we reach uh, back on to make sure that we understand. Uh, thank you for being here. Thank you. Uh, the next thing I guess let's jump into is um, the, the benefits of hemp, and, and the benefits of hemp uh, obviously on the cannabinoid side is, is uh, health, but the benefits on the building supply side is environment. Um, David, do you mind, uh, I'm sorry, Klein, do you mind jumping into um, some of the, the environmental benefits of it? Um, not at all. You hit my sweet spot. So, so the incredible thing about hemp, which as you know, has been used or may not know, has been used for over 10,000 years. Uh, the, in, in Asia 10,000 years ago, they were already starting to work with hemp as paper, and they were already working with hemp uh, to, to build buildings, to build hemp trees, basically. Um, hemp grows in a very small acreage, uh, a significant amount of hemp, to the point where an acre of hemp provides more oxygen into the air than an acre of forest. So for builders out there who are using wood, you're waiting X amount of years, although obviously we'll say properly, you're, you're waiting X amount of years for a tree to get a certain size so it can, can, can be cut to timber. Uh, with hemp, you can grow it outside and you can basically three times a year do a harvest. Uh, within that three times, you're producing three times as much wood material as you could get within that same amount of time. And that's even with strategic plans today. So you're putting out three times as much oxygen into the air. And the other good quality about hemp is that it actually absorbs carbon dioxide. So it's putting oxygen into the air and it's pulling in carbon dioxide. The final thing that it does, well, I shouldn't say final thing, but one, one of the- David, uh, Klein, your, your audio is having some issues. We're, we're having a hard time understanding it. I'm sorry. Can you hear better now? Can you hear better now? Oh. So um, it puts out three times as much oxygen into the air and it absorbs carbon dioxide. The final thing that it does is, is it actually is additive to the soil, whereas trees that are planted 
uh, destroy the soil, tear it apart. Uh, hemp actually revitalizes the soil. Those same properties then go into hemp creep or hemp insulation. So when you use hemp on a house, what you're doing is you're using hemp creep on the outside. Hemp will continue to hold on to the carbon dioxide and breathe oxygen. What the carbon dioxide does within both the hempcrete and the hemp insulation is A, bugs do not like carbon dioxide. So both hempcrete and hemp insulation uh, help to keep bugs away from your house. Uh, secondly, besides keeping bugs away from your house, it maintains three times as much moisture. So you don't have problems with flooding, you don't have as many problems with breathing. Finally, hemp is, and this is hard to believe, but you have to see it, it's fireproof because of the carbon dioxide. So you can take, and I, if I'm on video here, you can take a disc the size of a Frisbee of hemp compressed and only about four inches thick. And you can hold it in your hand like a, like a catcher's mitt. You can put a torch onto the other side, uh, a blow torch, let it light for five seconds. You'll watch it turn red and glowing. The guy will turn it around. You'll see he hasn't even burned his hand and he's holding his hand four or five inches away from a blowtorch, and the hemp never completely burns. So we've got something that's fireproof, that's bug resistant, that keeps you warmer in the winter and cooler in the summer and uh, fights away bugs. And uh, it's kind of, hard, kind of hard to beat. It sounds like it's too good to be true. <laughs> Uh, Kent Dunstan has joined us. Kent, do you mind giving us a 60 second infomercial on yourself? And that would be a no. Okay, so we'll keep moving on. Um, hopefully, he'll get caught back up at some point. Uh, David, I know you've got some experience growing not only in Florida, but throughout the world. Can you kind of give us your uh, 10,000 foot level of, of how you see uh, hemp uh, being able to be the quantity of hemp necessary for the building industry to be available? Yeah, um, so there, there's a, I think the demand goes with a, a market maturation. I think ultimately, just from a, a real macro standpoint, we're, we're heading that direction anyway. We need renewable materials. We need quickly renewable materials. Uh, and, and with population growth and housing demand, you know, the just traditional methods aren't, aren't going to hold up simply. I mean, we, I think it was two years ago was the first time in world history that humans moved more earth than natural disasters, uh, you know, so we're, we're at a, a stage of just an overwhelming amount of construction. So there, there's, there does have to be a fundamental change, but I think, uh, you know, before you can really, you know, one, I think if you look at it as just a, regular construction supplies and one-to-one -one, like directional lumber insulation and these things and not innovative things like structural insulated panels or these kind of hemp bricks or kind of stuff that, that you're seeing just in, in lean construction development overall but just one-to-one -one replacements for existing materials in a in a more eco-friendly way uh you know i think u.s demand alone is probably 40 to 50 million acres from a, a agronomic standpoint at a, at a fairly conservative assessment because you you got to think about uh you know replacement pine acres and then uh, you know where what other softwoods and then just additional deforestation or cycles and i mean so there's a, a significant growth curve but it, it does come with uh, kind of the adoption of, of products and and guys uh uh, like the, the, the home builder uh, learning and training their crews to use these products so that the market can grow. Uh, you know, I think, it, you know, and you've seen that with other construction products too, uh, you know, a hardy backer and some of the, the recycled plastic decking and those kind of things, they all started out before they got any kind of mass distribution was all direct to builder specialty build uh, type things uh, up until uh, they really got mass market appeal. And I think you could even draw some kind of parallels to, 
uh, you know, we probably need it for high end home builders like him to adopt it first too, just like uh, Tesla and the high end market segment pushing EVs. I think there's, uh, when you look at kind of the ESG surrounding uh, qualifications, it's, it's going to be very mirrored there. So it's, it's a robust market. And I think even more than I can predict when you look at all the, you know, 25,000 uses that people like to talk about, but just, just in regular stuff, I think the 40 million seems conservative over a 20 year arc. So, and that's going to make a lot of farmers happy, presumably. Um, I guess that's the other question that I had. Uh, David, you probably have a lot more economic knowledge of the value of the crops. I'm seeing uh, the cannabinoid type of uh, products going anywhere from $300 a pound, if not higher, for premium flour, down to as low as $4 a pound for biomass from last year. Um, where does the fiber fall into that? Uh, is it sold by the pound? Is it sold by the tensile strength? Or, 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 what's, what research is being done to your knowledge and what is the availability? Which David? <laughs> I'm sorry, pass an hour. <laughs> yeah. uh, so I think uh, mo most fiber and, and, and uh, biomass, not non-cannabinoid biomass, whether it's hemp or any other stuff is typically traded in what's called a bone dry ton. And uh, that, that's kind of the, the traditional unit of measurement around the existing fiber industry, which is already a robust trillion dollar market globally. And, and that's where hemp is, that side is really going to sector in. And it's, uh, you know, it's very affordable. I mean, it's, a, it's definitely a, a high volume, low margin uh, commodity. But that, that's, again, why I think the, the utility of a, of a dual crop where you're getting most of the fiber not out of a, a single purpose uh, crop, but rather your, your remaining dunnage from a grain, that's where you're going to get that, the economic sense because there's a, you know, I think you can get probably 300 pounds of grain and, and two tons uh, of fiber an acre with, with you know, good genetics and, and effective cropping systems. Uh, where you're you're competitive, cost competitive with some of these other specialty crops like cotton and uh, and, and other, you know tomatoes or eggplants or whatever you wish. Uh, so I, I just want to jump in for a second. Just want to Go ahead, David. For a second, other David. And I add to what, what what David said. What people don't realize is off of a, a a single strand of industrial hemp, you've got five different crops, five different industries that you can go vertically. And there really aren't many crops that do this. So with hemp, you have hemp seed, which uh, we all know it's one of the finest seeds you can eat. It's filled with amino acids. You've got greens. People eat the hemp greens and they're filled with amazing phytonutrients. So that's a whole different industry in the, in the food industry. You've got fast fiber, which we use in making products. You've got the root and the root pairs are being used in a completely different industry. And then finally, there's the core fiber that's in the inside. It's really more about what we'd be talking about uh, for building the hemp insulation and feet. Gotcha. So you've got five vertical industries. They're all pretty significant industries. Without saying one word about cannabinoids. So that's an, that's. Yeah, without saying anything about cannabinoids. Okay. This is pure industrial hemp. Right. One more, one more chance. Uh, Kent, are you with us? I think I am. All right. Will you Do you hear a, me? Uh, we can. Will you give us a 60 second infomercial about yourself? Yes, I'm um, I'm a long time uh, resident of Florida. I uh, have a lot of political experience in Florida. I was um, uh, I graduated from college uh, and was a, a engineer in the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers when I was 20 and covered the North Florida area for the civil division. I uh, did research and development for Goodyear for a couple of years and then worked uh, for a congressman from South Florida for five years in Washington and uh, Fort Lauderdale, done political statewide uh, pol uh, campaigns for the U.S. Senate, um, worked internationally uh, for over 10 years in the sports business and was the NFL's, if you remember the World League, uh, I was the first consultant for the Soviet Union for the NFL and put the first American football show and series and the first commercial ever shown on Soviet television and uh, came uh, back uh, to the U.S. after the 9-11 situation 
and uh, went to work for the division. Well, I've had two stints in state government, one with uh, HRS, if people remember Health and Rehabilitative Services, back in the uh, 80s. Uh, that agency was broken up because it was too large. We had 2,600 employees just in Broward County. And then we had, uh, I went to work for the DBPR in the Division of Land Sales, condominiums, mobile homes, yachts and ships, uh, timeshares, cooperatives, and have been heavily involved in the uh, interest of the building industry throughout the years. My father was a builder. Uh, I'm currently um, uh, about to retire from the state of Florida. I work for Broward College and have done so for the last 10 years. And the interest that I've had in this industry has been tremendous because of the natural resources that Florida brings to the, to the table. Literally everything that we need for this industry is located here in Florida, uh, especially for the hempcrete industry. But the reality is, is that this is a, a marketplace that is probably for a lot of us what you might call the last gold rush. And I'm very excited about what's happening in Florida. I'm excited about how the Department of Agriculture is interested in proceeding and developing, incubating new businesses. And I think that we're on the cusp of finding things that with this plant that we had never envisioned. And, and one of the examples I'd like to get is if no one's aware of it, uh, the flooring manufacturer company, Seversville in Tennessee, they're making hemp flooring hardwood hemp flooring. And it's just fascinating what they're able to do today with some of these products. So I'm pleased to be involved. I'm sorry I had trouble getting online, but uh, hopefully we can get something very positive to come out of this today. Uh, I appreciate you being here and thank you for that introduction. Um, I do want to kind of spin out on your DBPR a little bit and your, um, your, your national work. Um, I was talking earlier today with uh, with one of my friends, and they were talking about the Consumer Products Testing Commission. Is there something at the federal level or in DBPR that will allow that where the government can assist in getting these products tested so that builders uh, can can start adopting them? Uh, there's so many ver a variety of different uh, entities that we could probably access, and right now the biggest problem that we have on the federal side is the willingness of agencies to step out and be involved in this industry until they know they have the political support. And that's not gonna happen until after the election in terms of uh, seeing people willing, politicians being willing to step forward and say, okay, I'm ready to legalize this or I'm ready to do this. Right now, we're all just kind of in a, a pandemic shutdown in terms of what, what the federal government is going to do with this because nobody knows who the next president will be. Yeah. And we're not going to touch that one today. Um, so let's, uh, <laughs> let's keep rolling. I do believe that um, we can definitely agree that there are a myriad of different agencies that we can get involved. I think on the hemp side, much differently than the marijuana side. Uh, and I even hate to use the word marijuana. We'll, we'll use the word cannabis. On the cannabis side, um, you're, you've got five more states potentially legalizing it uh, in November. So I think that the tipping point, in my opinion, is already tipped, but we'll, let, we'll see what happens down the road. Um, getting back into um, the supply side, uh, David, 40 to 50 million acres seems like a, a, just a ridiculous amount of acres. Um, can you kind of put that into layman's terms as uh, of how you see that maybe rolling out? Do you see the corn, the corn farmers uh, in the Midwest or the citrus farmers in Florida? Who do you see filling that gap? <laughs> yeah, I think, I think you see uh, with, you know, ever increasing uh, losses on, on soy and, 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 and corn, there, there's just gonna be a, a bigger demand for a, an alternative crop, specifically in the Midwest. I do think Florida has potential, uh, but I just think there's so much acreage out there and, and, and it's so vastly needed uh, to diversify. I mean, the thing is, it's funny, is, is soy was actually a replacement crop for hemp. It, soy didn't come to the US till after hemp was made illegal. So, you know, the 50 million acres of soy we see 
you know, can easily be replaced by hemp. All, all the, the oil products and, and different industrial uses that are refined out, out of soy ha, have basically the same uh, availability out of hemp. And it's just, uh, you know, again, a, a, a less demanding crop at, at, for that type of production altogether. All and we haven't had any of the, you know, 100 years of crop de development and genetic, genetic breeding and all the other things that have gone into making these kind of super soy plants. So I think uh, there's definitely a, a learning curve, like I said, probably a 20 year arc, you know, just with crop development, you know, you know, you, know, you have you only, it takes so much time. I mean, you can't make a plant really grow faster to, to breed it and breed it and breed it, you know, it's, uh, it's gonna do what it's gonna do, uh, you know, as much as I wish I could, uh, you know, it's just, it's gonna go as fast as it goes. But um, yeah, I, you know, it, it does, it seems astronomical, but it, it, there's, we have two crops in the US that are already over 50 million acres between corn and soy. Uh, and, and, and a lot of those need to be replaced with something else. I mean, we only harvest about 55% of both those crops annually. So much of it's just left in the field to take checks from federal subsidies. I mean, it just doesn't make sense economically to keep supporting industries where we're paying people not to harvest material when we have a perfectly viable third industry that could be set up supportive and, and not a burden to the federal taxpayer. And, and you got to realize there's been hemp farmers, uh, I, I know on a lot of the, 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 the properties in Kentucky and in Oregon, you, you'll see a, a grandfather uh, sitting, on a, sitting on a porch, just kind of rocking back and forth. And they were growing hemp through World War II to the end of World War II because they were paid to grow hemp by the U.S. government. And these guys passed it down. And even though no one likes to talk about it, the reality is, They've been growing hemp uh, in between their corn fields for the last 50 years. Uh, after World War II, they didn't really stop because they continued to use hemp and there continued to be a market for hemp. So all across the central part of this country, from the Carolinas and Tennessee, all the way into Oklahoma, they've been growing industrial hemp for a long time. And that's a lot of land that's from here to there. It's great for the soil, as we've said. So I don't think it's not going to take long to get up to the capacity we need. It's going to be the demand curve that's really going to dictate it because they're ready to grow right now. Um, but there's not a market for it. It's early stage commodity and we're just at the really at the early innovation stage. Yeah, and I, and I think that, you know, if we get one of those $50 million Star Island homes that is made out of hemp, we may, get, we may catch somebody's attention. But Mark, I'm going to assume that uh, the people that are paying for those houses uh, are a little more hesitant to use them. Yeah, you know, that's probably not the target market for these guys, but you know, it's a place for everything. <laughs> All right, uh, Amanda, I think if it's okay with you, we can open it up for questions. That sounds good. Everybody, if you have any questions for our panelists, please put them uh, down below in the Q&A section and we're able to answer them. Panelists, in the meantime, if you have any questions of the other panelists, feel free. This would be a great time for you to ask them. Um, but we are here to, to um, answer any questions everybody might have. It looks like there might be a question for David H. Um, from Derek. He mentioned in the Zoom chat, he asked if you have any publications on your hemp trials in Florida. Do you have any planning dates yield uh, for fiber and grain? Uh, we we don't have anything out yet, but we will. We've uh, we published uh, some some other stuff through just generally through our newsletter, uh, GreenpointResearch.com. Uh, we post uh, regularly on. We post uh, our chief science officer and our director of plant science regularly do uh, articles and publications about the research they're doing. Uh, and we like I said, we do put out a, a monthly newsletter. So we, we don't have anything yet because we're really we're we're just winding up uh, about a week ago where the, the late summer emergence trials and everything. So uh, we haven't been able to synthesize it yet, but if you, uh, you follow us and subscribe to our newsletter, you will get uh, more information regarding uh, that data here in the, in the coming uh, months. Thanks, David. And uh, the University of Florida has put out some of their findings. Um, honestly, I think that because of COVID, um, you'll probably get some better information out of Rainpoint than you get out of UF but um, both of those are our sources.
looks like we have one more, a couple more questions coming in through the Q&A. The next question is, how do you see uh, developing the supply chain driving industrial demand from Bruce? David, you want to, Klein, you want to start that one? I don't want to touch that. The, the, <laughs> the, the, the supply chain is going to be a, probably the most painful part of this process. Um, so we're not going to have problems with growers. We're not going to have problems with processors. Um, we know there's people who already want to make, if we want to jump all the way to uh, hemp insulation or hemp free. Uh, but the supply chain of that is going to have to start at a very local level because that's where the building and the development is going to be done. Uh, a, a lot of this is just based on the reality of how it's happened. Very small markets have been developed. Uh, they typically will import the hemp. They know how to work with the hemp. The hemp crete, hemp insulation will be all manufactured basically there and fabricated. And, the, and that will go directly to being set and made to make home. So that's a completely local transaction except for the importation of the hemp. Uh, what's going to happen is another community nearby will happen. They'll start to be economies of scale. And just like with any diffusion of innovation, uh, all of a sudden, uh, two cities that are within 100 miles or 50 miles of each other will be doing the same thing. We'll find the economy of scale and efficiencies, and that'll start opening up the, the supply chain. Uh, there's already an international supply chain uh, for hemp. Uh, we buy and sell globally right now. It's a commodity. There's even some exchanges, so to speak, open. There's a, a, a London commodity exchange that handles hemp. We have one in New York. We have one in L.A., uh, there's one in Hong Kong that we work with. I was uh, I was there right before COVID broke out, uh, speaking on industrial hemp. So that end of it's all taken care of. But the rest of the supply chain is going to need to be put together by the construction industry and by using some of the same types of vehicles and distribution that they're using today. Yeah, I think from a, an R&D perspective, um, I know the Florida Hemp Council has been working with a group uh, that are trying to put together a hemp research park in St. Lucie County uh, using some uh, very interesting um, funding mechanisms uh, whereby you could theoretically have uh, an extraction, extraction facility, a drying facility, a decortication machine, a classifying machine, uh, all of the, the tools necessary for you to prove concept on site uh, and then scale off site. So I think that um, what I, you know, what I love about Florida um, is the same thing that sometimes I hate about Florida, which is the people. You've got some of the most brilliant people here, and then you've got Florida men. So we've got both sides of the <laughs> we get both, plots, both sides of the spectrum. <laughs> um, so you know, with that, I think that you're going to find that um, ultimately, where there is a demand, there will ultimately drive a supply. And as as more education happens, and more people realize, as Klein was telling us that. The insulation, uh, it, it repels bugs, uh, that it, it repels water, that it doesn't catch fire. As these things become more and more known, more and more people are going to demand them. And you know, generally in this country, things start in California and move east. But I think if we do this right, uh, we can get some things going and move it uh, up and up in the west. So Agreed. that's my hope. I, I think your comment about doing it right is probably the key to the entire process because again, yes, this product is gonna be local. There's gonna be a, a product to be able to create hemp, Crete in various locations, but the problem comes down later on, and we discussed this prior in a prior discussion, but it comes down at a, eventually to what the banks that are financing these homes uh, want to see in the homes in terms of certain protections in that if the homeowner is putting in their own uh, hempcrete, uh, what's to say that they're doing it in a way that is exactly right and it doesn't rot on them because a few bad stories is gonna spoil the industry. And what you have to have in this, and this is directed to, again, agriculture, is to set some standards in terms of density, viscosity, those kind of things in order to be able to assure that if someone puts in eight inches of, 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 of hempcrete, that they're going to get an R factor of 16. If they put in 12 inches, they're going to be an R factor of 24. 
but not everybody's going to build hempcrete the way it's supposed to be built. So therefore, it may affect realtors down the road who are trying to resell a house that can't be certified by a building inspector that this is quality construction, so the bank won't lend on it. One of the things that I'm seeing that seems to be a good startup for industries in this business where it doesn't exist at the moment is looking at entities that could be created, like at the research park, where you start creating a homogenous blend that you then put into hemp blocks, just like concrete blocks. They're making them now that look like Legos, and yeah. you put them together, and you seal them. They don't have the sa all the same properties in terms of completely being sealed as if you had stuffed the hempcrete into the wall yourself, because that's, that's a homogenous. You still have to use some Portland cement to cement the blocks together. But at least at that point, like concrete blocks, you've got something that is standardized, industry regulated, and it gives the lenders and the insurance company a reason to get behind the industry, as opposed to well, there's nothing but problems here because people are doing it themselves. Right. And I think, I think that is 100% of why we need uh, the state and federal government getting behind us with the certification and standardization. Um, there are examples, as David Klein was uh, talking about earlier, with multiple houses and communities being um, built with these products. We've got a house in Florida that was built over 20 years ago by Bob Clayton. And I think going back and, and researching Bob's work um, would be something that could be it, er, it certainly learned from because nobody really has seen what happens to hemp creek cinder blocks 20 years later. And I think that does exist in Florida. Well, that, that, that data is out there. And, and, I, and, and I want to defend the, the, the nascent industry a little bit. Uh, they've tested it, as I said, since the 40s in England, and those places are still standing. They're developing standards in England. They're developing standards in several other countries right now that will dictate what strains, what RH factors, everything that you would want uh, for, for a concrete or any other product. Two things. I've been living here in 35 years, almost 40 years in Florida. I've seen some concrete that was poured that wasn't exactly poured according to specs. Oh, yeah. So, so before, before we go blaming the hemp industry of not being standard, uh, you, know, I, 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 you know, I think we need, to, we, we need to watch our own industries. Um, well, I, I think the reason I brought it up was because this looks to me like it's going to become a do-it-yourself industry where people are going to buy products and mix it on site and create it themselves. And again, I, I don't, I'm not condemning the building industry. They work with what they have and they come forward with some pretty innovative stuff. But the reality is, is that this is a new product. There's all, I'm always concerned about people that spoil the market. A good example is the vaping industry where all of a sudden people got involved and they decided to do some cost cutting and they put vitamin E in and killed a bunch of people. Yeah. I'm not saying that's what's going to happen with hemp creek, but there's going to be horror stories and there's going to be stories of people that sold a house and it's environmentally sound. It's hundred percent hemp creek. And the first family that moves into it, all of a sudden they're very unhappy for some reason. I'm just saying that there's going to be people that probably need to be certified at least under DBPR standards in the state of Florida, that if you say you can build somebody a hemp creek house, that you're certified to do that. Completely agree. I think that agree. getting DBPR to talk to us would be an amazing thing. And, and I can tell you there, because I invited them and they won't, as uh, Slim Shady said, they won't stand up. There are some people <laughs> in the audience, there are some people in the audience uh, from the insurance industry who are very interested in this and whose actuarials are looking at it because they're starting to study and understand as insurance industry, as stodgy as it is, is quite often ahead of people in other ways because they're worried about what their live contingent liabilities are down the road, right? So they're already looking at hempcrete because they know it's going to be here in hemp insulation. They want to look at the assets because they see it as a potential savings uh, per house with houses that are made properly. 
And so they want to start looking at the history of it and keeping track of the data as they are right now. And I know they're definitely in Europe and they're definitely in Asia. And I think the more we begin to build this, the more they'll be taking a deep look. And I think they'll work hand in hand with the contractors, frankly. I think that's how it'll end up. Well, I know some people in Alabama that have permits for uh, growing and they've been growing. One of their, they have to do everything in Tennessee. Everything has to be moved up to Tennessee for extraction and milling. And uh, they, their, their biggest problem right now is they've got uh, too much of the, of, the, of, the, of the stalks that they can't get rid of. And that's where we started talking about hemp creep. But the other thing that's coming up that we're talking about is that there's an offer or a, um, a, a negotiation going on uh, regarding uh, a major clothing manufacturer in the United States that wants to buy uh, hemp for clothing, which is going to get big, but it's expensive at this moment. But the good news is they, they seem to want it in the bales. They don't want it milled. They'll do it themselves, which if this cuts loose in Alabama, they've asked me to try to set up North Florida farmers to provide whatever overage we can give them. But I mean, there's all kinds of opportunities that are, that are going to pop up here. And I think the, the main thing is uh, the state has to set priorities. Otherwise it's going to be whack-a-mole. Uh, and, and Ken, that puts out a, a big point. I had a defense contractor uh, ask me for th two inch, three tensile strength hemp fibers about a year ago. And after searching for it for nine months, finally found it, uh, tried to reach out to the guy and can't get a hold of it. And I think that's the other half of the battle. I, I'm a salesperson in, in my soul. Um, you got to have product to sell. Well, and you can't you can't create a demand you can't feel. That angers right. people. Right. And what that what you just described is stronger than steel. It's twice <laughs> as strong as steel. Oh, it is. It's, uh, yeah. The, the Chinese, ninety five percent of their military outfits are made of hemp, and they discovered what? that. And actually, in World War II, when some of them were hiding in caves and it was really hot, they found that hemp fibers kept, because of the moisture absorption, it kept them cleaner and healthier and warmer. Uh, and they realized this tensile strength of it. And so if you go to China today, about 90% of the uniforms, especially with uh, what we'll call their Delta Forces and Special Forces, uh, it, it, it's, made of, it's, it's made of hemp fiber. And you can punch somebody and hit them with a knife and it the knife kind of slides off of it. It's very interesting. So it, there's a huge market for this. Amanda, you got something else? We do have a couple more questions, kind of in, in line with what we were discussing about the, the supply chains. Uh, in, in the next five years, how do you see international trade of hemp changing on an international level? I think the EU adopting 0.3% THC was a huge step towards uh, global standardization. Uh, Either one of you guys want to jump in, you're welcome to. They've been doing it in Europe a long time. So uh, yeah. the big big market for South Florida is probably going to be the islands. I mean, it's uh, there's uh, they, they don't have enough land and everything has to be shipped into the islands. And so this would be a good market for fabric and so forth that would be useful there. But uh, like I said, there's going to be a number of different opportunities. And uh, this is just the start of something big. Well, you, you take a country like Belize, where you can grow, have three outdoor seasons, and they have all these boats coming in because Belize brings everything in, but the boats have to leave empty. You know, it's a lot like what happens in Miami. That's true. That's uh, very and, true. And so in Belize, they're starting to work with, uh, I have a um, small company that I have a little tiny piece of in Belize, and they make uh, uh, biodegradable and compostable straws, napkins, plates, forks, knives, and it's all based out of hemp. They grow the hemp there, uh, they make it, and they sell it for international distribution. So, um, you know, there's one way it's already being used uh, uh, to get rid of plastic, single-use plastic, which have been banned in Belize and a whole host of other countries. So there, there's another use for it, um, uh, you know, that, that's helpful for developing nations uh, uh, to have an export. Yeah, they biodegrade, they're making biodegradable bottles out of hemp, and they say the uh, 
a regular plastic bottle will last about four or 500 years. This will disintegrate within like 90 days. Yeah, so the, only have, the only problem they have is with, with the caps that go. Yeah. Because they haven't been able to get the fitting to be proper, but they definitely have the bottles. They're actually, some of, some of them are compostable. Which is right. amazing. You can drink in your Coca-Cola and you throw it in your backyard in your compost pile. That, that's pretty profound. Well, I see, I've seen some videos of where they can spray on. You were talking about making plastic, but they have molds and they just spray it on and it's it's as hard as steel. It's plastic. It's it's you don't need the current plastic market today, which is the same issue that you would have with the oil industry wanting to get rid of solar. But the bottom line is, is that this has been something that has been kept from the American people for what, 60 years? And uh, so. And you can, this, you can even, you can, you can injection mold it or you can extrude it on the same extrusion machines that we use today. We make straws. Uh, we buy used extruders because it's down in Belize. We buy them on the international market and bring them in and we extrude straws. Uh, no different than plastic. So, you know, again, we have people doing quarter paneling. I think that we all discussed this in an earlier meeting. Uh, there are people in the Midwest right now that I, think, I believe for Honda, certain makes of Honda and Chevrolets are making the front, left, and right quarter panels out of hemp. Yeah, uh, I think Mercedes is doing that in Europe. They're putting yeah. in hemp panels and soundproofing. Yep. So it's, you know, you keep saying people laugh when you say, oh, there's hundreds and hundreds of uses, and you can't think of them. But as you sit here and you hear of what's happening, you recognize the importance of this plant and that it's not going away. Great. I tried to write out the tw I tried to write out the twenty five thousand uses and got to about three hundred, but <laughs> it, it, it invariably in conversations like this that I've been having and anecdotal conversations elsewhere, I'm adding five or six a week. Um, so it it really does permeate our entire uh, being from uh, potentially a hemp fiber for batteries uh, to be able to use better than nickel cadmium uh, to hemp um, combined with sugar cellulose to create a better plastic feeling plastic. Uh, I think there's a ton of different options out there. Uh, a lot of this comes down to money. Um, you know, Big Sugar invested $30 million uh, to build the Telus uh, factory that makes the sugar cellulose um, biodegradable products. You've got to have a lot of money pumped in here uh, to, to get the R&D done to be able to figure out what can be done with these products. Great. I know we're running a little close on time here, so I'll just ask one final question and we'll probably jump off. Everybody, I know you have a lot of questions. Um, we're not going to be able to get to them all. Uh, I do see several questions here for regarding hempcrete. Um, specifically, are there any solid standards on hempcrete? Um, and it, where is hempcrete at this point getting through the Florida building code? I think that'll be a Kent or David Klein question. I'd I, I, I believe the R, I, I believe the R factor conversation that we had earlier is going to be the qualifying standard. Um, as far as the um, size of fiber that goes into the hempcrete, that standardization doesn't exist to my knowledge. Uh, Hassenauer, do you know anything about that? I know ASTM actually has a committee formed around hempcrete and has done some of the, I know like the R certification standardization is already there. And I think they've gotten, I think they have done some of the mill size and specific, uh, you know, input requirements or, around that. But I, ASTM does have, I think it's the D37 uh, is the actual number designation for it, but they, they are working through that standard uh, standardization process now. And they have obviously ASTM does standards for everything. Yeah. And, Makes and I, perfect. Think, I think some of that testing is getting over to Leeds, the, the Leeds approval process, which we also spoke about a, about a week ago. Uh, right. I talked to some people this week about Leeds just to find out where they were. And they were tying into research firms to look at the uh, carbon footprint of this so that they could start certifying homes uh, that are now being made as Leeds certified. So that's an impressive standard there that they're working on. Yeah, that would be amazing. <laughs> Uh, yeah, 
Well, that's good. Uh, ASTM and the uh, uh, U.S. Green Building Council's LEED certification standards would be two things that you can research uh, as far as hemp create standardization. One of the other things that I had observed as I started, I used to be involved heavily in zoning issues, but one of the things I observed in, in a lot of the instances where they were looking at how the, the materials were able to be used is a lot of the zoning standards, they tell you what they want and then they, they add this disclaimer, other suitable materials. And that's where this has fallen into. So at this point, we may need to be in a situation where we have to start defining these suitable materials, uh, at least for this industry. Because what you don't want is quacks involved. And, and there, will, uh, there will be some. <laughs> well, that's where DBPR comes in. I mean, they have, in, they have investigators and just like uh, what they do with real estate agents, they, I mean, this is, or, or contractors. I mean, uh, we used to regulate contractors and uh, it was a very interesting period. Uh, we, we were there during the transition between paper to digital. So at this point, I know they have the capabilities of doing this, and I'm quite sure they'd be happy to start bringing in the uh, licensing fees from people who want to be certified. So you, would, I, you, would, I, you would think that, Kent, but trying to get somebody from DBPR to respond to us has been a challenge. <laughs> it, it, it's going to have to come from the, the secretary and the governor going to have to come from the cabinet i'm sure so at this yeah. point we wait for the election and then see what shakes out after the election nobody's making serious decisions at this point amanda i think this is the perfect place to stop we read everybody's mind and everybody's <laughs> intentionally being quiet <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm so sorry if we didn't get to your question. Um, if you have, you know, I, I, I'm happy to follow up with anybody who still has questions. Feel free to reach out to us on Facebook. Um, you're welcome to email me. My email is amanda at flllawforall.com. Um, if you, ha if, I believe most of our panelists are on LinkedIn, so feel free to reach out and LinkedIn them. If you have specific questions for them, they can answer questions that way as well. We thank you all for joining. Uh, gentlemen, thank you for your time. Um, it's been a great discussion. I wish we had longer. I think we could go on for another several hours, but I've definitely learned a lot. So thank you so much for your time and efforts here today. Thank you, thank you Amanda. Thank you very much. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Have Good a great job. day. Yeah.